taste of what this guy's been able to do. He was so consistent. I mean, I wasn't that consistent. I mean, I won a lot of majors, but he's incredible. It was obvious he had what it took to be a great, but he went much, much further than we all thought. He's definitely one of the most dominant players of his time. I was winning all four majors on all surfaces. Serve very well, volley very well, forehand good, backhand good. So for that reason, he's the best of the world. He's unbelievably fast. He's a super athlete. He's definitely the most successful. His um, level of, of, or his average of playing is just so much higher than anybody else. I'm so happy that, you know, all my hard work has paid off 10,000 times more than I ever thought it would. Ever since 1877, the great and good of the tennis world have travelled to London to take part in the world's oldest tournament, Wimbledon, the most prestigious of the four Grand Slams and the one that every player wants to win. The honours board of the All England Club is full of illustrious names and in 1998, another emerged, Roger Federer. The 16-year-old from Switzerland became junior champion following in the footsteps of Bjorn Borg and Pat Cash, both winners of Junior Wimbledon, who went on to take the senior title. Federer would become arguably the greatest player in the history of the game. Yet those present that day were unaware that they were witnessing a legend in the making. I was fooling around back in the day, you know, with my friends saying, oh, I've won Wimbledon, you know, and is it real or is it just a dream? And then eventually when you become, you know, a professional tennis player and have won the junior Wimbledon, then you're, you know, you get much closer to, to reality and you think, well, maybe it is possible after all. Roger Federer was born in 1981 in Binningen, a village just outside Basel, close to Switzerland's borders with Germany and France. As a schoolboy, Federer showed early promise on the court and joined the old boys' tennis club in Basel. And like all youngsters, he had his idols. My first tennis memories must be when I picked up a, a wooden racket first up and the white tennis balls back then. Um, and then watching Becker and Edberg play at Wimbledon um, in the finals, so sitting in the living room uh, watching them play. The Becker boom. It was huge in, in Switzerland when he made the breakthrough and he won at such a young age. Ed Burke was so well liked around the world and with his playing style that they were automatically a big influence on, um, on the way I played. I also had a one-handed backhand so I, I was obviously also looking usually always for a one-handed backhand too to um, have as an idol. The club has named one of their courts in his honour and those still there remember his early days. He was just a normal boy who, who liked to have fun on the court, in the training. And um, in the matches he was very eager. He always wanted to be, from the first day, he wanted to be number one in the world. As Federer grew, so did his ambition. The Swiss tennis fraternity was starting to take notice. I joined the National Tennis Centre in Switzerland when I was 14 years old and I uh, moved away from home, uh, stayed with a, a family from Monday to Friday that weren't my parents and uh, you know I was homesick. This is I think my first big sacrifice I did as a, as a player. Today Federer is renowned for his calm demeanour and ability to handle pressure, but that was not always the case. I really had to adjust, you know, I had to work harder become more serious, not get um, upset on the court in a minute because I was really acting bad, you know, when I was, when I was younger. In 1999, he made his debut at a Grand Slam. The 17-year-old was ranked 111th in the world and faced reigning US Open champion, Australian Pat Rafter, in the first round of the French Open. Federer took the first set, eventually losing three sets to one. For those who knew him best, though, could see Federer was a star in the making. I've always thought that he, he'll become a, a tennis professional, that he will 
you know, become a good player because already when he was very young, you could see he, he had so much talent. And, and, uh, but I would have never thought that he will, you know, get as good as he got. His first ATP Tour title arrived in February 2001. He won the Milan Indoor Open, defeating France's Julien Boutel in the final. Federer was quickly making a name for himself on the circuit. He saw it in the early ages of his career where he already had uh, some potentials, but also some, you know, missing points, you know. And, and then when he started to work more serious and, and work a lot also physically and, and, and mentally, he uh, all of a sudden then surprised everybody. Nowhere would this be more evident than on the grandest stage. Federer's love affair with Wimbledon began with that junior title. And in 2001, he caused one of the biggest ever upsets in Wimbledon history. In the fourth round, he defeated four-time defending champion Pete Sampras, ending the Americans' unbeaten run of 31 matches at Wimbledon. Two years later, Federer went all the way to the final, his first in a Grand Slam event. He faced Mark Philippoussis. Walking on the court, you know, was, was tough. I was very nervous going into the match, you know, just knowing that this is a big opportunity. The Philippoussis match for me was, uh, was real difficult in some ways because all of a sudden I made it through to my first Grand Slam final and I was the favourite. Up to then, the Australian's opponents had struggled against his big serve, but not Federer, whose confidence belied his inexperience. He raced to a two-set lead. Philippoussis had no answer. The third set went to a tie-break, the tie-break went to Federer, and at 21, he'd won his first Grand Slam. I played fantastic tennis once more, and. Uh, and I was able to win, and I remember the emotions were just, just, just too much for me. It was similar to when I beat Sampras in 2001. I had tears in my eyes, and uh, I was just so happy to share this moment with my family and friends. A lot of people came from Basel and home, and it's so nice, you know, to share this moment. And thanks to everybody, it was great. <laughs> A year later, Federer reached the final again. He displaced Andy Roddick as world number one in January, and it was the American who stood in his way. I was really nervous going into the match because Andy before and was playing well, and I always, uh, I always, he always gives me a fright. He came out playing so aggressive like I've never seen him play before. He totally changed his game plan. Roddick took the first set, 6-4. I came really back really strong in the second set. I was up four love, but he broke me back twice. And all of a sudden I was in a, in a tough battle in the second set, and, and I won that after all. With the match tied at one set all, Federer had to dig deep. He took the third, and Roddick wilted. And at 5-4 in the fourth set, Federer had championship point. That was for sure my hard-fought uh, Wimbledon win. I had to really play exceptional tennis and especially play well on the big points because I had to save so many opportunities. In 2005, Federer was looking for a third successive Wimbledon title. Across the net again, Andy Roddick. The third time around, I was uh, going in there, I felt with a as a bit more of a favourite, um, and I, I did play very well. Game set. I was pretty much always in control. I came through and, and played really, really well, so that was kind of, for me, like a proof, you know, I'm still the best on grass. Federer won in straight sets and became only the third man since the Open era began in 1968 to win three consecutive Wimbledon titles. Most visitors fall in love with the French capital, Paris. But the French Open proved problematic for Roger Federer. The tournament, commonly known as Roland Garros, 
is the only one of the four Grand Slam events to be played on clay, the game's slowest surface. Although his domination of Wimbledon underlined him as the best on grass, across the English Channel, it was a different story. Federer made his debut there in 1999, but it would take him seven years to reach the final. In 2006, he faced defending champion and Spanish sensation, 19-year-old Rafael Nadal, who had dominated the clay season. You'll always run into a player who's just uh, fitter or fresher or, or you know, just, just playing better on the day you know, than you. You have to be able to accept that. The Spanish have always produced clay court specialists, and Nadal was the latest, outplaying Federer to retain his title. Nadal won three sets to one, Federer's first defeat in a Grand Slam final. If you're one of maybe the all-time greats, um, you'll always have pressure because people expect you to win every single tournament, which is just clearly not possible in tennis because of the knockout system. Less than a month later, the two came face to face again in the final at Wimbledon. It was Nadal's first appearance in tennis's blue ribboned match. He faced the task of preventing Federer, becoming only the third male to win the title four years running. I wasn't too surprised to see Nadal in the finals and we just played in the French Open finals. For me, it was my first time in the French Open finals against each other and I played actually pretty good in that final and but still ended up losing. So I was actually very happy to finally I got him on grass and not always have to play him on clay. But on grass, it was a different story. I started very, very well. I won the first set, six love, and that against, you know, your biggest rival is the, is, is the best start you could get. I kind of actually played all the way through very well and served out the game very nicely. Federer had won his fourth consecutive Wimbledon singles title. Six love, seven six, six seven, six three. And the greatest men's tennis rivalry since Bjorn Borg and John McEnroe was blossoming. Their rivalry is fantastic for, for the game of tennis. It's, uh, it's, it's saved tennis in many ways because Roger was so good that he was in a league of his own and, and dominating too much. Um, you need some great rivalries. And certainly the interest uh, for, for tennis around the world was sparked up by this young Spanish kid coming in. In 2007, Nadal again defeated Federer in the final of the French Open. But just like the previous year, the Swiss didn't have long to wait for revenge. Wimbledon gave Federer the chance to equal the record of Bjorn Borg by winning the title five years in succession. Of course, very happy that Bjorn Borg's around too, kind of following me closely because I could equal his record of five and it would be a, an absolute dream come true. Federer took a two sets to one lead. But Nadal was much improved on grass. The Spaniard won the fourth set to take the match into a decisive fifth. But Federer showed his class, winning the set 6-2 to equal Borg's feet, achieved 27 years earlier. Each one is special, uh, no doubt, equaling Bjorn as well. So it's... <laughs> Nadal had to wait until the following year's French Open to take what was now becoming customary revenge. Federer lost to the Spaniard in the final for the third year in succession. I think rivalries are very important in tennis. Um, you want to see the best two against each other all the time. Hopefully they're not that far apart, so it's actually a real match. And the final of Wimbledon in 2008 was an epic. An astonishing rain-delayed match lasting nearly five hours saw Nadal triumph 9-7 in the final set. Federer's dream of a record sixth successive title was dashed. After two sets all, he played fantastic. And the fifth set was, I think, uh, one of the more emotional sets that I played in my in my career and probably uh, I never want to play another. Got a little late and everything, but look, uh, Rafa's a deserving champ and he, he just played fantastic. At the 2008 Beijing Olympics, Federer carried the flag for his country for the second time. 
he'd failed to win a medal in 2000 and 2004. But this time he and Stanislav Wawrinka triumphed. Successful in the men's doubles against Sweden's Simon Aspelin and Thomas Johansson. Just weeks after that gold medal success, Federer created history at Flushing Meadow, New York, winning his fifth successive US Open. Only Americans Pete Sampras and Jimmy Connors had won the title five times, but neither had done so consecutively. Federer's win over Britain's Andy Murray gave him his 13th Grand Slam, just one behind the record held by Sampras. And the American was resigned to Federer not just equaling his achievement, but overtaking him. I don't think anyone really scares him. I think he respects everyone, but I don't think he, he has that fear uh, from, from anyone except maybe Nadal on clay. Ironically, his attempt at number 14 came at the tournament that had proved to be his nemesis, the French Open, the only Grand Slam he'd yet to win. Federer himself was confident, but the spectre of Pete Sampras's record began to loom large. The whole records thing is, you know, being brought up again, and that's uh, always very nice, you know, but at this stage, right before the tournament, I'm more concentrated just of getting through the early rounds and hopefully finding the groove. And he did, reaching the final for the fourth successive year. He'd lost the previous three to Nadal, but this time the defending champion had been knocked out in the fourth round. Federer faced Nadal's conqueror, Sweden's Robin Sodling. Nadal's absence seemed to inspire Federer. He used the drop shot to good effect to take the first set 6-1. He closed out the second set on a tie-break with an ace. Exactly 10 years after his debut at the tournament, Federer finally ended his Paris hoodoo, becoming only the third man in the Open era to win all four majors. And of course, he'd equaled Sampras's record. The weight made it even more special uh, once I was able to really get uh, the win at Roland Garros. The feeling was quite different to all the other slams I've, I've ever won. Um, and uh, looking back, it was um, probably one of my most emotional wins in my career. Less than a month later, at Wimbledon, Pete Sampras was at centre court as Federer attempted to break his Grand Slam record. He met Andy Roddick, the American he defeated at the same stage twice before. For the third year running, Federer was involved in a five-set final. He broke Roddick's serve for the first time in the final set to win 16-14 and clinched that historic 15th Grand Slam. It's not really one of those goals you set, you know, as a little boy, but uh, I don't know, it feels amazing, you know, but this is not why I'm playing tennis, to break all sort of different records, but it's, it's definitely one of the greatest ones to have. To be there was, it was pretty cool. I'm not bitter you know, by any means, I just, I'm, if anything, I'm amazed at what this guy's been able to do, being so consistent. And he made it Grand Slam number 16, winning the Australian Open for the fourth time in 2010 defeating Britain's Andy Murray in straight sets. The victory made him the first male to win three different Grand Slams on four occasions. Roger Federer's outstanding career has made him one of the most recognisable figures in tennis or any sport. A champion, a genius, the greatest player to play the game. He's a gentleman, he's a you know, fine man, he's a great role model for tennis. The way he plays tennis, uh, the way he, he um, treats, you know, treats everybody else, his, his composure on the court. A serial winner, not least at Grand Slams, the complete player. If you look at Roger, you'll say, um, OK, does he have the best serve in the world? No. Does he have the best four in the world? No. Does he have the best back in the world? No. Does he have the best volleys in the world? Well, no. But he is, everything is probably in the top three you know, top four of players, uh, maybe of all time. So you put that all together and you've got an unbelievably good player. He has become a hero to Switzerland and become his country's most famous ever sports person. 
He was even awarded a title one, one year, the Swiss of the year, which is not limited to sportsmen only, but to the whole population. And uh, yeah, his impact is huge. He's the best ambassador probably Switzerland could dream for. Roger is the greatest player in history because of all the titles he's won, his longevity, and the fact he can play on every surface. In terms of uh, what he's done for the sport, absolutely Roger Federer is the most, uh, the most important tennis player of any time. He was once a ball boy who dreamed of becoming a pro. My motivation uh, has come from my idols, my heroes, um, myself living a dream as a kid, wanting to become a great player. The young Federer made his dream come true. Now youngsters look to him as a role model, and they couldn't choose anyone better. I have many people, you know, holding up signs, um, waiting for me for, to sign autographs and, uh, you know, take a picture with me. And that's something that really motivates me in a big way. And uh, I hope I can keep it up for much, much longer.